Welcome to this session um, entitled Resilience, Definitions, Transitions, and Jurisdictions. We really have four outstanding speakers today that will be sharing their research uh, this morning. I will go ahead and introduce our speakers and their topics um, one by one. Then we will move into their presentations followed by a Q&A uh, session. So our first presenter is Alison Shifani, who's an assistant professor of digital humanities in the Department of Modern Languages and Literature at the University of Miami. Her presentation is Against Resilience, Climate Capacities in Miami and the Right to the City. Following will be Camila Sabla, um, who is team presenting with Perla Aquino, Madison Simpson, Paula Cristina Viala. They're all from the Urban Sustainability and Resiliency Program at the University of Miami. And their title presentation is Dirty Little Secrets of Climate Adaptation and Resilience Indexes, a Caribbean assessment of four indexes. Following is Gustavo Sanchez Ugalde, uh, who is a principal at the GHS uh, studio and Professor Sonia Chao, Director of the Center for Urban and Community Design at the University of Miami. And their title is Understanding the Terror and its relevance to urban design in light of climate change. Finally, we will hear from Caitlin Cuchiota, who's an environmental analyst in the Palm Beach County Office of Resilience. And she will be presenting on tackling climate change across jurisdictional boundaries. So we're gonna hear the four presentations. And as you hear the presentations, please kindly use the Q&A chat box to post your questions. We will address all questions after the presentations have been shared. When you share your questions, please use or uh, indicate who are you addressing your questions to. Um, so finally, once we, um, we hear from uh, all presenters, we will have a lively and rich discussion. Today, you will hear uh, multiple angles and perspectives on the question of climate resilience. And I hope you enjoy these presentations. My name is Allison Shafani. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures here at the University of Miami. Let me go ahead and get started. The title of my talk today is Against Resilience, Climate Capacities in Miami and the Right to the City. The denizen of Miami and South Florida, indeed those of the entire subtropical region of which we form a part, are no strangers to the term resilience. In a community suffering the increasingly dire impacts of anthropogenic climate change, everyone from real estate developers to climate activists employ it. It is popularly viewed as both a necessity and even a moral good, but resilience discourse, so ubiquitous in Miami's ongoing development projects, its governmental strategies, and even its activist interventions has been consistently under interrogated by those with the power to shape, govern, and administer to the city. I'm gonna to argue today that resilience is inextricably tied with capitalist and imperialist projects, and as such, it forecloses rather than opens up possibilities for a more sustainable and equitable city. I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, resilience discourse has been consistently and effectively critiqued and across a variety of disciplines outside of architecture and urban studies. Melinda Cooper and Jeremy Walker in security studies 
have traced the term's reemergence and deployment in the post 9-11 US. They track its ties both to uh, neoliberal economic policy and the US state's desire to engender docility in subjects through adaptability and flexibility, which are of course essential qualities of labor under the precarious conditions of the current economic regime. Brad Evans and Julian Reed, working across disciplines in a book length study of resilience, have argued that resilience subordinates human life to both environmental and economic systems, removing autonomy and agency from human participants in these systems. Resilience is meant to produce, they write, quote, a subject that must permanently struggle to accommodate itself to the world, not a political subject that can conceive of changing the world its structure and conditions of possibility with a view of securing itself from the world, but a subject which accepts the disastrousness of the world it lives in as a condition of partaking in that world and which accepts the necessity of the injunction to change itself in correspondence with threats and dangers now presupposed as endemic. From what might seem the distant camp of literary and cultural studies also come compelling critiques of resilience discourse. It is, as my colleague Lindsay Thomas uh, elegantly shows in her book, Training for Catastrophe, Fictions of National Security After 9-11, tightly bound with xenophobic constructions of the homeland in the US context. Kaima McGlover has also written compellingly against resilience discourse in which she finds racialized Western narratives of Haitian suffering. Quote, sneakily embedded in the notion of resilience is repugnance, end quote. She traces the ways black subjects in the end may be praised for resilience, even while their suffering is consumed as a kind of pornography by Western viewers. She goes on, in the end, resilience can only mean a capacity for suffering combined with a refusal to lie down, to stay down and to die, end quote. Resilience is framed primarily in an echo of its use to describe materials as an ability to return to form, regardless of pressures and pulls. A building, a person, a community, or an economy is said to be resilient if it can withstand loss and suffering and further return to form in its aftermath. In urban contexts, uh, this almost exclusively means that resilience precludes anything but acquiescence to the status quo. We are, as resilient, meant to design our way out of crisis, make good decisions that will mean we can easily recover from damage or trauma, perform and embody a quality of adaptability, flexibility, and in the end, docility, a willingness always to return to and submit to the same systems, even those that brought catastrophe to us. As David Chandler and Reed have pointed out, quote, the inculcation of resilience, in fact, depends on the dematerializing or abstraction from specific risks or insecurities to become a mode of life, a way of social being. Tracing the development of resilience discourse from the liberal to the neoliberal era, they explain the deep contradictions in the production of the neoliberal subject, that he does not, in fact, have a fully rational relationship to the external world, much less control it, yet must be inculcated to make rational good decisions that nonetheless do indeed shape that same external world. Quote, the problem for societal resilience is always the human rather than the societal relations in which humans are embedded, end quote. In other words, resilience refuses to actually look at the real conditions of the world in that it offers not a real assessment of the risks we face, but only abstractions and speculations of an always impending catastrophe that if it ever materializes, leaves communities and individuals, not structures, holding the bag and the blame. Neoliberal or otherwise, of course, resilience in the urban context is fundamentally tied to capitalism. Its mandated logic of endless capital accumulation cannot consent to, can in fact rarely conceive of, change that is not coeval with growth. We don't give up on high-rise condos in Miami. We imagine instead engineering our way out of perpetual flooding. We don't depart from regions at extreme flood risk, ceding them to rising seas and increasingly unpredictable storms. We prefer instead high gloss specs produced by the firms of star architects that swear to us we can continue to build despite the rising tides and warming waters. Whatever resilience is under the current economic regime, it cannot mean legitimate transformation, but only a perpetual maintenance of current social forms and norms. 
Uh, for a local example, we might look to Miami's participation in the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities Initiative. One result of that participation was a 154 page report titled Resilient 305, outlining resilient strategies for greater Miami and beaches. This document is now used to guide resilient strategies in the city um, as a mechanism to address the severe affordable housing shortage in the county and economic disenfranch disenfranchisement of many of its inhabitants. The report offers only additional capitalist development. Quote, 67 federally designated opportunity zones have been mapped in Miami-Dade County to revitalize economically distressed communities using private investments, it claims, offering, quote, atlas of opportunity, uh, pardon me, an atlas of opportunity, and quote, the document vaguely explains that, quote, to yield maximum financial benefits, the private sector will be looking to make quick decisions on where to invest. The Opportunity Zone program presents an opening for community leaders to focus on resilient strategies and work with opportunity funds to achieve and accelerate broad-based outcomes, end quote. Note that it is community leaders who are asked to focus on these so-called resilient strategy, strategies so that they can have access to private funds and so their communities can welcome private sector investment. City governments in this model do little more than advertise to investors on behalf of the disenfranchised people and places under their governance. Furthermore, Resilient 305 never once uses the term black or even African-American, never refers to race at all, but instead, instead focuses on a vaguely defined diversity. The document acknowledges, quote, an overwhelmed criminal justice system, uh, as well as an average household income 19% lower than the national average, end quote, but outright refuses to look at the links between the two nor are connections made between race and a carceral state or between poverty and the ethnicity or race. Yet the Resilient 305 policies claim to quote, address shocks and stresses in a holistic manner, end quote. Clearly, resilience in this context stands on the erasure of certain communities and experiences rather than a real assessment of their risks. It actively avoids addressing systemic oppression that literally imperils the lives and well-beings of many. In this way, it ignores the very barriers to resilience that, the fa that face the city's actual inhabitants. Resilience then serves to wrest what Henry Lefebvre called the right to the city from its proper holders and instead to keep it in the hands of the very few. In Miami, that means primarily real estate developers and wealthy investors, many of them foreign, who treat structures in the urban landscape as apartment-shaped financial instruments. David Harvey has argued forcefully against urban policies and development that work like the Resilient 305 report and its resultant policy recommendations toward capitalist accumulation as the primary driver of urban planning and administration. He describes the results of such processes as accumulation by dispossession. Low income residents and communities are perpetually displaced through gentrification, development, infrastructure projects and other processes. Harvey argues, in fact, that accumulation by possession is at the very center of urbanization under capitalism. Looking at the Resilient 305 report and really almost all current development in and around Miami, we can see this process occurring in real time. Climate gentrification is, as we speak, dispersing communities like the longtime Bahamian enclave of Coconut Grove, the historically, historically Black Overtown, and Little Haiti. According to Harvey, quote, the right to the city is far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. It is a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It is moreover a common rather than an individual right since this transformation inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power to reshape the process of urbanization, end quote. That right to the city is counter to resilience as it is usually deployed because it envisions a commons where resilience discourse insists instead on individual choice. Furthermore, the right to the city here indicates real revolutionary transformation as its aim, not flexibility, not adaptability, and certainly not a return to form. I want to work against the maintenance of form so essential to the capitalist and imperialist projects that leverage and rely on resilient discourse in order to elide other possible ways of facing risk, particularly those risks 
engendered by the interlocking fields of climate and contemporary capitalist ideology. And so doing, I'm turning to two brief examples, um, forms of engaging the city that are already extant on the ground in and around Miami and that actively work against resilience discourse in favor of a more radical urban intervention. I've, I've selected them because they frame engagement with the climate crisis in terms of capacities rather than qualities and in terms of large scale, even revolutionary change rather than return to form or reform instead of adaptation, revolt, instead of perpetual growth and accumulation, refusal. The first of these inter interventions I'll discuss is one I wrote about in my book. Um, in August of 2016, a single piece of graffiti was painted on the top floor of the abandoned South Shore Hospital building at the gateway to Miami Beach. In enormous black letters, an anonymous artist spelled out the following sentence, your million dollar houses will soon be underwater. Though it remained on the building only briefly, later circulating in local and national press and through social media, this illicit public text made clear that its author was not invested in resilience, but in something else. A notion of shared, though asymmetrically distributed, precarity, as well as in fostering awareness of the strong ties between economic development practices and climate catastrophe. To be underwater is at once literal and figurative here. Debt and housing costs are linked to, in the work to Miami's very specific position under threat in a changing climate. This piece of graffiti does not suggest a return to form, but rather that returns are no longer possible. It is a form of leveraging the impending catastrophe on which resilience discourse often depends against its own ends by insisting that the urban landscape as it is, can and is changed by agentive intervention. Graffiti as a form, after all, materially alters the city. The second example that offers alternative modeling of urban work and resists the accumulative logic of capital comes in the form of the queer arts collective Femme Power. The Miami-based collective grew out of a work of speculative fiction written by its founder, Helen Pena. In it, Pena imagines a post-apocalyptic Miami run by a revolutionary girl gang, a motley crew composed mostly of queer women of color. From there, the group blossomed into an urban fairy garden, is what they call it, um, in Little Haiti, which actively positions itself against climate gentrification. They also developed a community bond fund, they host cultural events, and they are still a working collective of artists. The group's investment in seeing the city through a radical speculative lens not only frustrates standard narratives of resilience, which situates individuals as per perpetually alert and prepared rather than active and world shaping, but also insists that other better futures are possible within the context of the increasing risks posed by climate change. Their work suggests a joyous revolution instead of a docile recovery and return. The flood may be coming, but what we build in its wake remains open. These brief examples are meant to demonstrate that there are ways of imagining our urban ecologies outside of resilience discourse. They suggest that extant in the everyday cities we inhabit are capacities to rethink, rebuild, and even revolt against the demands placed on people and communities by the current social, economic, and political systems that govern them. Such work is essential if we are ever to claim our right to the city, a right that belongs to us all and that must be exercised in common not only as atomized resilient individuals or disparate communities. Harvey writes, quote, only when it is understood that those who build and sustain urban life have a primary claim to that which they have produced and that one of their claims is the unalienated right to make the city more after their own heart's desire will we arrive at a politics of the urban that makes sense, end quote. A sense-making politics in Miami, of course, means a politics politics of climate justice that is anti-capitalist and decolonial. And to bring it into being, we must work against, not under the banner of resilience. The model of response to climate change that the activists and artists discussed here seek to engender does not, unlike resilience discourse, rely on the construction of strong borders between self and other, between homeland and elsewhere. Where resilience discourse demands flexibility and constant preparedness from subjects, these other way of engaging the climate crisis rather see agents and communal subjects whose participation in the making of the city can be both valued and fun. Where resilience discourse attaches to a quality of being in a person, a building, a governmental plan, 
these models suggest instead communal capacity. If we are to face the dire threats of the unfolding climate crisis, it is a shared capacity to alter our city and in so doing, alter ourselves that we will need. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the discussion. Hello everyone, my name is Camila Sabla and I, along with my classmates Perla Aquino, Madison Simpson and Christina Viala, will give a presentation on a research paper called Dirty Little Secrets of Climate Adaptation and Resilience Indexes, a Caribbean Assessment of Four Indexes. Although not presenting with us today, this paper was also written with Professor Richard Grant and Professor Shura Senison Roy of the University of Miami. Countries of the Caribbean region share a common vulnerability to climate change. Many of its island nations and other coastal communities in the subregion are at risk of disappearing if the dangers of climate change and global warming are not addressed collectively and urgently. With no agreed global standard metric, the adaptation measurement landscape has several competing indexes. Over the last decade, four important open source international indexes have been developed and employed in research and policy as a measurement tool to assist governments, businesses, and communities to aggregate data and examine risks exacerbated by climate change across a myriad of indicators. These four indexes are the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index, or NDGAIN, the Yale Environmental Performance Index, EPI, the German Watch Global Climate Risk Index, CRI, and the Good Life Index, GLI. Countries are ranked internationally based on their level of vulnerability and readiness to implement adaptation solutions. No index is developed specifically for the Caribbean nor by members of the region themselves. Thus, we provide a timely assessment of the four indexes and review individual country performances for 29 countries from 2010 to 2020. The Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index offered the most comprehensive and consistent coverage in the Caribbean with a detailed evaluation for 16 of the 29 countries over the study period of 2010 to 2018. The ND Gain Index measures the country's vulnerability to climate disruptions in relation to its readiness. This index measures two dimensions, vulnerability and readiness. Each sector is represented by six indicators to take account of the sector's exposure to climate-related hazards, the sensitivity of that sector to the impacts of the hazard, and the adaptive sectoral capacity to cope and adapt. Readiness is composed of nine indicators to assess a country's ability to leverage investments for adaptation in terms of economic, governance, and social dimensions. The NDGAIN score calculates the values of core vulnerability and readiness indicators on a scale from zero to one, where a lower vulnerability score and a higher readiness score is better. It is computed by subtracting the vulnerability score from the readiness score for each country and scaling the scores to compile a value from zero to 100. Results are plotted in terms of a matrix of a quadrant for quick visualization of comparative resilience and progress thereof. Countries consistently ranking higher include Grenada, Barbados, St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominica and St. Lucia, while the countries consistently ranking poorly include Haiti, Guyana, Belize and Cuba. Grenada showed the most improvement and ranked the highest in the index in the Caribbean region. Higher overall performance for countries is attributed to relatively higher readiness and low vulnerability scores as seen in these maps. Grenada and Jamaica showed improvement in readiness while Antigua and Barbuda showed the most decline. Haiti, Belize, Guyana, and Cuba rank poorly in low readiness and high vulnerability. All of the countries experienced declining trends in ND gain scores during the study period, except for Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, and Suriname. We also analyzed the Neville and inertia for the different countries between 2010 and 2018. Dominican Republic, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname showed the maximum inertia in overall scores and readiness and vulnerability. The countries that showed the least inertia included Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica and Bahamas, which was also reflected in their readiness and vulnerability scores. The next index will be the Yale EPI. The Yale EPI assesses 180 countries that have been ranked on 24 performance indicators. Of these 180 countries, nine of them were found in the Caribbean. 
The study will focus on the reports between the years 2010 and 2020. The reports come out roughly every two years, so this study will focus on five total reports. The index ranks each country amongst each other, along with the 2020 report including an analysis on their 10-year change. Yale focuses on incorporating the Millennial Development Goal 7, while incorporating information from international research institutions such as the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and other international organizations such as the World Bank, WHO, and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. Here's a graph of how Yale um, assesses each and every country. As you can see, the 24 performance indicators are assessed on the outside ring of the circle, with nine being on the inner ring. How Yale works is that it primarily focuses us on these nine different indicators. As you can see, each one holds a different amount of weight, climate change being one of the bigger ones. This means that if a country was to perform better in the climate change sector and not as well in fisheries, they would rank higher than a country that was to rank better in fisheries and not as well as climate change. As you can see, the two largest categories are ecosystem vitality and environmental health, with vitality having a larger weight than health. The Caribbean ranked mostly in the lower half of the 180 countries through the consistent years. However, it is important to note that this index does not include the social circumstances of each country, such as economic, social, or income of that country. Cuba, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago ranked the highest of the Caribbean countries, with Haiti, Guyana, and Suriname ranking amongst the lowest. Haiti in 2020 ranked 170 out of the 180 countries. This is a graph of the report that was done in 2020 of the 10-year change of each individual country. As you can see, some had a negative change while others continued to improve throughout the 10 years. As you can see, some such as Trinidad and Tobago had a rather large improvement, while some being not as significant. Here are the tables of the 10 year reports of each country found in the Caribbean. As you can see, some have massive increases while others decrease. It is important to note that the ranks, the lower you are, the better you've done amongst the other countries, where the score, the higher your score is, the better you've performed. Each one has a different sense of inertia. For example, Jamaica has a rather good one, starting out in rank 89 and then shooting up to 66 amongst the different countries. On the other hand, countries such as Belize had a rather negative effect, with it starting out in 26 in 2010 and then plummeting down to 101 by 2020. Chairman Watch's Global Climate Risk Index includes 16 of the Caribbean countries, and we're going to be looking at yearly data from the years 2010 to the year 2018. The Global Climate Risk Index, also known as CRI, was developed by German Watch, and it analyzes the impacts of extreme weather events in terms of fatalities as well as economic losses based on the data from the Munich Green NatCat Service, which is one of the most complete and trusted databases in the world. Its aim is to contextualize ongoing climate policy debates by looking at real world impacts over the last year and the last 20 years, and to draw conclusions for the purpose of political discussions regarding which country is the most vulnerable to climate change. This the next focus is on extreme weather events and does not consider important slow onset processes such as rising sea levels, glacier melting, or more acidic and warmer seas. Due to the limitations of the available data, some very small countries such as certain small island states are not included in this analysis, and the CRI examines both absolute and relative impacts to create an average ranking of countries in four indicating categories. The countries ranking the highest have the lowest numbers and are the ones most impacted. There are two different data sets given by the index. One contains yearly data and the other contains mean data for a decade. The decade data takes into consideration an environmental factor called number of events. The analyzed indicators can be divided into social and economic. The social are number of deaths, a number of deaths between per 100,000 inhabitants. The economic are the sum of losses in US dollars in purchasing power parity and the losses per unit of gross domestic product. Each country's index score has been derived from a country's average ranking in all four indicating ca categories according to the following way. 
When taking a look at the basic stats, we can see that the CRIs fluctuated for each country from the years of 2010 to 2018. And within this, we can see that countries such as Grenada and Suriname consistently ranked well, while countries such as Haiti and Puerto Rico ranked poorly. When seeing the annual fluctuations, we can also see that Suriname was the country that ranked the highest out of all the other Caribbean countries in the index and country and the countries such as Haiti was the one that's ranked lowest out of all the countries in the index. You can also notice that there is only data for Puerto Rico starting at the year 2015 and that some peaks are reduced or start to increase in certain years such as in the year 2017, for example. Within the findings of these index is that Haiti consistently ranks poorly having the lowest rank three times out of all the Caribbean. It also ranks the worst overall in the index twice throughout the years. Suriname consistently ranks well having the highest rank five times out of all the Caribbean and it showed the least variation across the years. Puerto Rico ranks the worst overall in the index once. It showed the most variation across the years and it also received the minimum CRI of 1.5. The maximum CRI was received by several countries and it was 126.17. Three countries showed consistent decline, which were Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Lucia. And the country that showed the most consistent improvement was St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The final index is the Good Life Index, which defines a good life for all within planetary boundaries. The Good Life Index uses the safe and just framework created by Kate Rathworth. There are nine planetary boundaries related to critical Earth system processes, which define the safe space for humanity to stay into the relative stable conditions of the Holocene period. Eleven social indicators follow the social objectives contained in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The data is available for the following five Caribbean countries. Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. The Good Life data set is based on the year 2011 and the data is analyzed across the biophysical indicators, which include CO2 emissions, phosphorus, nitrogen, blue water, EHANPP, ecological and material footprint. According to The Good Life, the best performing in that category is Haiti with zero boundaries transgressed. And the least performing is Trinidad and Tobago with 10 boundaries transgressed. On the social indicator side, this is reversed. The performance is calculated for 2011 across 11 social indicators, which include life satisfaction, healthy life expectancy, sanitation, social support, democratic quality, employment, income, access to energy, education, and nutrition. In this category, the best performing is Trinidad and followed by Cuba and the least performing is Haiti. The data was analyzed from 2011 to 2019 across several social and biophysical indicators. Overall, most countries have improved across those indicators, but as you can see, there's a lot of missing data in Haiti and Trinidad and Tobago is a large emitter of CO2 emissions. The Good Life Index is a complex and comprehensive index with both social and biophysical indicators. The countries that rank best in social indicators are usually the worst environmental performers. Trinidad and Tobago ranks well on social indicators, but this country is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, such as CO2 and methane. Haiti does not transgress its biophysical boundaries, therefore performing best in that category, but however, not fully utilizing its natural resources. The country does not meet standards on social indicators and lacks data in certain category. Data is also missing for Cuba across many indicators. 
In conclusion, when we compared all the indexes, we found that the country that improved the most was Jamaica, while the country that exhibited the least inertia was Puerto Rico and Haiti regularly ranked poorly. These conclusions were drawn according to countries that were repeated in at least two of the indices. The strengths of the different indices are as follows. The ND gain is the index with the most transparent methodology and most comprehensive coverage of countries in the Caribbean region. Yale EPI covers a broad range of countries and different regions with a variety of indicators. The German CRI index includes data for numerous countries and provides data within a broad time frame. The Good Life Index is the most innovative index composed of novel indicators. These indices offer some limitations and the gain consists of a countrywide scope and needs data at a finer scale. Yale EPI does not consider social conditions of country. German CRI does not provide environmental data and Good Life Index only provides data for a limited number of countries. All indexes had many data gaps across several indicators and countries. Clearly, there's not a universal solution to climate change and every adaptation must be suited to the environmental, social, economic, political, and cultural context of the country in which it is implemented. Valuable lessons were learned from the comparative analysis of the indices. The paper is available for more information. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. This presentation summarily weaves together a new conceptual framework related to settlement and human interventions upon the landscape. We shall frame the paradigm of the spirit of place, a concept carefully examined by the architectural theorist Noble Schul, along with the manifestation of the terroir, together constituting the phenomenology of the natural and cultural ecological union, which in turn establishes their codependence upon each other and to the rapidly evolving coastal landscape due to climate expediting process. Let's start by tracing the action within this parallel paradigm. We shall begin the process by distillation and addressing the following questions through this presentation. How are placemaking strategies informed by nature? What are the relationships between settlements and their host context? What are our motivations to inhabit the place? And finally, why and how have humans persisted in inhabiting places where nature seems inhospitable? So from the very moment in which humans fixed a conscious gaze upon the unaffected natural world and allowed themselves to be carried away by their sensorial aptitudes, they subjected that context to interpretations and thereafter understood that which lay before them as landscape. And in that very instance, they defined their relationship to and connections with that, that specific place thereby giving rise to the origin of an environmental identity specific to place. Across history, this connection has commonly informed placemaking actions, at least more commonly so before the 20th century, when thereafter those connections were often diluted or altogether erased. Throughout history, humanity has faced the constant duality of responding to challenges or to to opportunities presented by nature, either by imitation or by contrast, as we can see in this image. Architectural historian Vincent Scully once wrote that architecture is one of the major strategies whereby human societies mediate between the individual and nature's laws by trying to make the natural world make sense in human terms. Architecture's first reference point, he argued, is the topography of a place and the nuances of settlements that arise in that place are how human beings respond to it with their own built forms. In Machu Picchu, for example, imitation and symbiosis between man and nature gave rise to the origin of an environmental identity specific to that particular place, which is probably a testament to why it has endured the test of time and of nature. Now let's tie those approaches to the concept of genealogy, this Latin term used in ancient Rome literally meant 
the genius of place and was understood as a divine presence manifested through the spirit that gives life to people and places and which determines their character or their essence. Norbert Schultz in his publication, Genius Loci, emphasized that human identity emerges from the identity of place. Or put another way, we would add that it refers to its fundamental essence, its uniqueness, resulting from a harmonious relationship between the macro scales and the micro scales, from the human being to the habitat, to the ecosystem, to the biome in its diverse physical manifestations, or to quote Scully, from the natural to the man-made. Now Norbert Schultz stated that humans make these connections in three fundamental ways. In the first place, a human being wants to visualize his or her understanding of nature, and to achieve this, individuals interpret and build what they have actually seen. Thus, where nature suggests a delimited space, humans build an enclosure. And where nature appears to centralize, they erect a landmark. And where nature indicates a direction, they lay a path. In the second manner, often human settlements complement their given context adding what is sensed to be needed, what is perceived to be missing, or respond to an opportunity provided by the larger host context. And lastly, humans symbolize their understanding of nature by including themselves in the vision of a landscape. Thus, these three primary relationships imply that humans gather their experienced meanings from their natural context to create a microcosm concretizes their world. The encounter depends on symbolization and implies a transposition of meanings to another place, thus becoming existential. Therefore, the genealogy paradigm suggests that the genesis of character and identity related to placemaking lies in the geomorphology of the place. There are also generalized aspects, of course, such as the climate zone factors, is this place arid or is it tropical? And other very exacting and particular conditions such as its flora, its fauna and geology, which together of course may generate their own microclimate and by extension, the human systems such as urban morphologies, building technologies and cultural attributes. Collectively, these aspects make a location unique and unrepeatable. Venice, Italy, and the Venetian in Las Vegas share no real common denominators, for example. Perhaps then we would like to suggest that the widely accepted paradigmatic example that brings together the parallel concepts discussed so far together under one umbrella, and one which is centered precisely on such overlapping symbiotic relationships is in fact not one commonly associated with architecture and urban design, but instead with agriculture, manifested by the concept of terroir. This term fundamentally defines the holistic combination of characteristics which are unique to a specific territory. Terroir is a delimited geographical area defined by a human community which builds along with its history, a set of distinctive features, knowledge and practices based on a system of interactions between the natural environment and human factors. Those interactions result in original and specific products and services that in turn can be easily recognized. Think of France's Champagne versus Italy's Prosecco. But in Congress, it also generates places with a specific identity, precisely because of their balanced and codependent relationships. That assembly of factors also affects the people living in that area, their social mores, their economy and collective identity. The terroirs are living and evolving places and are not static, either in their relationships or in their identity. The manner and degree to which inhabitants interact with their landscape greatly frames the more or less symbiotic relationships between them. 
When balance is achieved, it is culturally sympathetic and ingrained just as much as it is environmentally attuned. Within these dynamic processes, inhabitants contribute towards a given location's specific inward and outward identity and condition, cementing the manifestation of the terroir, which we further define as the various tangible and intangible elements and the interplay between them in that specific location. In this manner, the rural and urban settlements are to be considered part of that overall manifestation of the terroir's characteristics and of its makeup. Perhaps we can deconstruct the elements of these places to arrive at the typicity of existing settlements as a means to bolster, protect, and develop their essence and spirit of place, as is done with other terroir products. Here we see a singular example at the street and block scale, a pedestrian street known as Callejón de los Cielos in Jerez, Spain. Here the vineyards are unusually employed in an urban setting to roof over a pedestrian alley. The deciduous vegetation of the vines protect passersby from the summer heat, creating its own microclimate. But it also serves to remind passersby of their connectedness to the natural realm, symbolically, physically, and economically. And as illustrated in this image, such a symbiosis and climatic consonance allows the sun's rays to bathe the urban realm on a winter's day. And by absorbing heat from the sun and refracting light from the building's whitewashed walls, yet another microclimate is achieved. And it is one where a cultural and natural integration is in tune with the passing seasons. And this too is a manifestation of terroir in urban terms. To better understand the behavior of coastal and floodplain settlements the war and measure risk realistically, it is important to learn from the pragmatic history and tradition of those locations, which do have a long history in dealing with the threat of rising water, such as the Netherlands and Germany, and in specific, with the coastal areas along the Western Sea. Marshes and prisons are a dual entity. In settlements on top of man-made mounds, most commonly called warts or turfs, in a treeless landscape of marshes, people have lived there since the 7th century before Christ and continue to do so to this day. The Roman soldier Pliny the Elder described the first century this culture. There, twice in every 24 hours, the ocean vast tide swept in flood over the large stretch of land and hides nature everlasting controversy about whether the, re the region belongs to the land or to the sea. The rough approaches and techniques make evident that the more extreme the place, the more humans will need to associate with the land and understand its needs if they are to prosper. The extreme relationship implies a tuned coexistence as a one living organism, thus becoming existential. I am constituting the phenomenology of the natural and cultural ecological union. Storm surges have largely shaped today's landscape in the 10th to 16th century. The current islands are a remnant of the cold coastal dunes. In Jordan's 1362, a storm hit the Wallen Sea in, and changed the coast with such violent force that the port city of Ramport was completely destroyed. The storm surge was called the Great Drowning, estimating more than 25,000 dead. In 1674, another storm destroyed the coast, estimating between 8 and 15,000 from people drowned and catastrophic material damage. Much of Strand Island was raised from the ground, forming North Strand, Tolowon, and a very small unprotected islands. Floods are not only from the sea, but also from the rivers. In the 15th century, landowners and residents began to build levees along the coastline to seal off the mainland, including most settlement, settlements and arable land. Those areas are called polders. Like this idyllic view of pro-polder in waterland, 
is Victoria City lives by the water, with canals and meadows near Amsterdam. Due to the permanent rise in sea level and storm surges intensification, levy construction techniques have steadily improved through these centuries. But since high water levels recorded in the 1990s in the Netherlands, water management's approach has changed, seeking to reserve more space for rivers rather than straightening and build dikes. The Dutch solution to floods live with water don't fight it. The most recent turps were built 10 years ago in the Overdeep Sea Polder in the Netherlands, and it's one of the more than 30 projects for the room or for the river program. Preventive measures are being taken in the polder to increase the river drainage capacity during the flood, the so called widening the river. This project is special because the polders' inhabitants and stakeholders came up with the solutions from the beginning, the third plan. To protect the city and surrounding areas from flooding, the decision was made to depolder the over deep sea polder. This is done by lowering the existing levees and building new ones further in. The over deep sea polder was placed outside the levee area. On average, this means that the water will flow into the polder once every 25 years. A large part of the farms remained in the polder by moving them to the turfs along the new levee. The combination of agriculture and overflow regions allows farmers to remain there in the future. Another room for the river successful project is named Midgen's new flood protection for Walt River. The project offers greater safety, accommodating floods, and adds new natural and recreational areas. The design is based on the river water dynamics, the erosion and sedimentation process, and the tides. However, to make more room from the river, a change in land use made individuals and businesses to be relocated. Haven City is located on the Alp River, in the former port of Hamburg. It was formally established in 2008 and included the historical Spiker Stad area, which since 2015 is a UNESCO World Heritage Site with the adjacent Contour House District. As an alternative to dikes, Haven City has fallen back on the settlement pattern tradition in the North Sea area, the world. The roads are raised at 8.5 meters, and the service network is accommodated in a layer of sand. Building plots do not need to be raised. Instead of basement story, an artificial base is built, usually on a historic port level of 4.5 meters. The exterior wall of the pin is built to be watertight. Where the pin's level abuts the prominent, it will be accessible at ground level. Flat gates or comparable technical equipment protect restaurants and stores in the plane. Above the plane's level, the first floor is level with the sidewalks on the street. The resulting topography characterizes the cityscape of Haven City. The public spaces, the a public spaces system is designed at different levels, connecting land and water, and the lower levels are prepared to flood. The world's model protects Haven City during the strong storm surges that occur about twice a year. City life on wards can continue largely unaffected. The prominence are only flooded for a brief period. The solution retains the water level's dependence on the tides and the city district results in special character on the earth. Now across the Atlantic, we find similar issues arising, literally for communities all along the Eastern seaboard, including South Florida. And whereas we are not suggesting that we transport their terroir-based thinking solutions here verbatim, we do suggest that we distill our attitudes towards this place as they did for their locations, allowing strategies to also evolve over time as the territory evolves. So as to foster responsible, viable, and equitable community designs. Experts 
have alerted us that rising seas will completely change the identity of our city and our relationship with the natural environment. Our ongoing investigations have led Gustavo and I to contemplate a future archipelago of cities in our region in the decades to come, each vibrant and more in balance with its natural context than today. To share what that potential reality may be like and the actions needed to realize it, the next few slides illustrate a project executed during the Resilient Redesign 3 Charette hosted by the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact in collaboration with local experts and leaders just a few years ago. And by the way, some of those ideas wound up informing a later ULI report for the region. The schematic design ambitions and TOD at the heart of the Arctic's future community race tension. Surrounded by a network of corridors and urban nodes interconnected by efficient local transit. This high intensity urban network should be part of the evacuation routes and TDRs within areas, while the most vulnerable areas are will be the TDR setting areas, opening the chance to restore natural systems and building social resilience on higher ground. Specifically, we discussed and explore urban intensities and TDR opportunities through the design process that will evolve with time, analyzing the implications of a typical low density block sending area to a high density receiving site with the potential of 10, 30, or 40 story buildings. That allows to understand a quantitative capacity and visualize how the growth could happen with the different scenarios. The exercise helps reimagine and reconfiguring the territory efficiently, making room for flood scapes and natural reclaimed natural corridors. When we talked about racing roads, where and how would they occur? For example, it is not realistic in South Florida to think that we can fill with land all the areas that we are racing. It is important to understand that commuter rail station and another infrastructure that we are now laying out on the ground, due to the sea level rise increase and land restriction, one day we'll need to develop additional infrastructure layers on top of the existing ones. Which at some point will also evolve as part of the repurposed underground, underwater public basement infrastructure system that could hold transportation infrastructure and water storage. Now, in this image, we can see where a future Miami-Dade County could very well bridge between traditions and innovations, and between the natural and the man-made, creating handsome subtropical public spaces, which connect us to each other, to nature, and to our typicity and the local ingrained identity while making predictable places for human habitation and accommodating an increased presence of water, be it in formal or in informal spaces. As you can see, these glimpses into a possible future Miami-Dade County are very much connected to its landscape. In fact, they make way for a more harmonious relationship between living with the terrain, as well as the growing manifestation of water across our terrain, while permitting a larger portion of our population to remain within the region. Academic Kevin Lynch once wrote, nothing is experienced by itself, but always in relationship to its surroundings, to the sequences of events leading up to it, and the memory of past experiences and their meaning. The image of the city may evolve in ways unimagined at present, but the end game should be to strive for an equitable society where a harmonious balance between the natural and the man-made can exist and where the subtropical character of our terroir prevails and informs decision-making. To achieve such necessary yet lofty goals, perhaps we start by more intentionally marrying our human settlements with their natural context, establishing coherent and respectful dialogues between them from the micro scale of parcel and streets to the macro interventions across neighborhoods and the region. In this manner, the spirit 
of this place and its unique concert of characteristics, the manifestation of its terroir in all things, be they natural or man-made, will result in a natural and ecological unit, which becomes identifiable and unrepeatable. Gustavo and I conclude with the following quote by Italo Calvino. Cities may believe that they are the result of the work of the nine or of the chance, but neither are enough to maintain their world standing. From a city you do not enjoy the seven or 77, not always, but rather the answer it provides to a question you pose, or the question it asks you which forces you to respond. Thank you for Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Cucinata from Palm Beach County's Office of Resilience, and I'm honored to speak with you today about a joint climate change vulnerability assessment that the county just uh, started to wrap up with seven municipalities in the southeast region of our uh, county. So during this presentation, we'll talk about how, how and why this micro regional partnership formed, what the process was for completing the vulnerability assessment, what we've learned from the regional results, and of course, what we're doing um, with those results to increase climate resiliency in the region. So to begin with, um, Palm Beach County, which is roughly one hour north of the University of Miami campus, um, covers just under 2000 square miles. This is larger than the entire state of Delaware or Rhode Island, and we're home to about 1.5 million year round residents. Um, in Palm Beach County, there are 39 municipalities with most of the urban population residing in incorporated coastal municipalities, as you can see in the satellite image to the bottom left. So that's where the Coastal Resilience Partnership of Southeast Palm Beach County comes into play. The CRP or Coastal Resilience Partnership of Southeast Palm Beach County is a micro-regional partnership between Boca Raton, Boynton Beach, Delray Beach, Highland Beach, Ocean Ridge, um, Lantana, Lake Worth Beach, and Palm Beach County, working to complete a joint climate change vulnerability assessment or a study of how current and future climate variations will impact local assets. These jurisdictions share several co common features, as you might imagine, along the coast, including roughly 20, a, a roughly 20 mile stretch of intracoastal waterway, along with roads and utilities, similar physical, geographic, and social characteristics and populations, similar climate change impacts and threats, such as sunny, sunny day flooding, coastal erosion, and uh, extreme storms, concern about vulnerability to extreme temperatures, storm surge, and saltwater intrusion, and then a lack of a comprehensive vulnerability assessment. Recognizing these shared concerns, uh, sustainability professionals and municipal planners started getting together back in 2017, and then decided to pursue a joint vulnerability assessment in order to leverage the knowledge base within the region, um, reduce overall costs for each municipality on such a, a study, increase competitiveness for grant funding, employ a consistent methodology um, throughout the region in a vulnerability assessment and um, across so that communications could be unified somewhat, and then to foster synergy in developing and implementing adaptation, adaptation strategies. So our thought in the Coastal Resilience Partnership um, of Southeast Palm Beach County is that these problems don't stop at jurisdictional boundaries and neither should the solutions. So what is a vulnerability assessment exactly? A climate change vulnerability assessment provides a foundational understanding of the risks a specific area or asset faces as it relates to climate threats. For this study, we, we followed the steps shown um, in the graphic to the right, which were adapted from the US Climate Resilience Toolkit. As you can see, the first few steps included deciding on what assets, sorry, deciding on what climate threats the region was most interested in studying, and then assembling geospatial and uh, narrative data on community assets. 
this took a significant amount of time considering the uh, eight different jurisdictions involved in the study. We then completed the vulnerability assessment uh, considering risk and vulnerability of specific assets in the study area, looked into strategies for both individual and joint um, micro-regional adaptation between CRP communities. And then just this month, we'll be reviewing a final report for the public, um, an executive summary as well, and some, some graphics to share that we'll, we'll use to roll out the results of this uh, Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment, or CCVA. So the study um, focused on 12 specific climate threats, which range from high winds and rainfall-induced flooding to extreme, extreme heat and saltwater intrusion. All 12 threats were selected and prioritized with stakeholder input. And as you might notice, sea level rise is not included here. Um, that's because the CRP chose to approach sea level rise as a primary stressor to multiple threats rather than a climate threat itself. So for example, um, in the study, we assume that sea level rise interact, interacts as a compounding event with rainfall-induced flooding. Um, sea level rise accelerates the movement of shoreline, will increase frequency and severity of tidal flooding, uh, increases risks from storm surge. And then of course, um, we consider sea level rise to be a primary cause of groundwater inundation and saltwater intrusion. Before we move on to discuss the assets analyzed, I just wanted to mention that public engagement was a very important part of this project and is essential to the success of the CRP. In addition to various industry presentations and panel discussions uh, our CRP has participated in in the last year or two, um, we have also hosted two public workshops and one is upcoming this summer when we roll out the final report as well as six staff workshops and one micro-regional survey. So given the barriers that we faced in 2020 um, throughout the project timeline, basically, it was near impossible to get to the public to host in-person workshops with real engaging um, activities and uh, you know, great workshops. So we did our best with these public online um, webinars and breakout rooms, and then we had an online survey where we reached roughly 600, 630 stakeholders from the study area. And we asked questions um, such as, what are the top three climate threats uh, most concerning to you as it relates to this study area? And the re results are shown on the screen here. Um, you might notice that the top three were tidal flooding, shoreline recession, and extreme heat. And so we used this um, survey to inform how we approach the study and the adaptation strategies and what we focus on in the final report. Uh, we looked at how all 12 threats previously mentioned um, impacted uh, different asset categories as shown on the screen here. And those range from critical facilities such as energy infrastructure, hospitals, fire stations, um, police stations, to water infrastructure, natural resources, people and populations, um, and then different types of properties such as cultural, commercial, and residential. When looking at each asset category, we were assessing both their vulnerability and their risk. So vulnerability is based on the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity of an asset. An example of this would be a fire station is more likely to be vulnerable to flooding than a, an open space um, or park field next door. And then risk is based on the probability and consequence of a threat impacting an asset. For example, the fire station and park may have the same probability of being flooded, but the consequences and risks of the fire station flooding uh, are most definitely greater. This all goes into calculation um, called Combined Vulnerability and Risk, which was then used in, um, in mapping and you know, the results maps to show, to show overall vulnerability and risk um, of the different assets. So here you can see an example of one threat assessed in the study, tidal flooding, um, which if you recall was the number one most concerning threat when we surveyed those 630 plus stakeholders. 
Tidal flooding refers to above normal tide events that are unrelated to a storm and flow over land to inundate streets and other areas. Sea level rise was considered a stressor to tidal flooding and aging infrastructure was considered a non-climate stressor. So the, con the consultant team that worked on this looked at uh, stormwater master plans, measured and predicted tides within the study area, sea level rise projections, digital elevation models, um, other GIS models and data, and then NOAA studies and reports on tidal flooding. Here you can see the preliminary results of tidal flooding um, in the study area. And this is mapped by census tract for both 2040, which would we assume to be, um, to look like 2020 plus 13 inches of sea level rise, and then 2070, which would be 2020 um, plus 33 inches of sea level rise. So in, this, in these uh, assessments, um, the project team was able to see that although a small percentage of properties in the uh, overall study area are or may be pot potentially impacted by tidal flooding in the future, the uh, replacement value of those properties is um, significantly or substantially greater than the number of properties. More details on this will be uh, shared in the final report, um, but just wanted to share a sample of the results. However, we didn't stop there with uh, the assessments. So social vulnerability was considered in assessments to be a co-occurrence of each climate threat. And uh, the, the, on this slide, you can see examples of socioeconomic data that went into the assessments. The map on the left shows overall social vulnerability in the study area as measured by the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. The middle map shows median household income based on the Census uh, Bureau data. And then the map on the, on the right shows percent of households receiving SNAP benefits, which is also based on census data. So with that, and this is why the 30 plus 33 will make sense. This final image um, is a sample of how we would use this data and shows a layer depicting number of workers relying on, on public transportation overlaid on a map from the previous slide depicting what tidal flooding in 2070 might look like. So the purple hash marks here uh, symbolize census tracts where between 67 and 373 people rely on public transportation for work, which allows us to see priority areas for ensuring public transportation remains operational through tidal flooding, which will be especially important in evacuation situations. The extreme heat assessment was a bit different than most because we looked at the impact of a climate threat directly on, on human populations. And here, socioeconomic data was combined with land cover maps to determine where the highest temperatures and lowest percentage of canopy cover uh, correlated with lower income levels, sensitive populations, and other information provided by the, the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index. Uh, just as a snippet of the results, the most vulnerable areas in the study area were those with more than 85% developed land cover, meaning little to no uh, green cover or canopy cover, less than 6% tree canopy cover, sensitive populations, uh, such as household members over 65 or under 18, and high socioeconomic stress. To wrap up the climate change vulnerability assessment project, the team engaged with staff to discuss and prioritize adaptation strategies, both for the CRP region and each of the eight local governments to consider. The suggested uh, strategies fall into these six main buckets, um, ranging from increasing green infrastructure to updating land use policies, and to ensure we're considering and working with frontline communities or those uh, who often experience climate change first and worst, will be our next steps will be um, finding opportunities to build relationships, expanding frontline uh, capacity and sharing climate literacy, and then reducing, working through these adaptation strategies to reduce historical or current disparities um, as we, build a more resilient Southeast Palm Beach County. 
We hope this project can serve as an inspiration for other micro regional climate change vulnerability assessments in South Florida and in the county in particular, because this CRP exemplifies how local governments can come together to address uh, shared local challenges through shared solutions. This was only the first step for the Coastal, Coastal Resilience Partnership, and of course, uh, implementing adaptation strategies and solutions will be a ton of work and will take collaboration with um, an un unlimited number of stakeholders and government uh, agencies. And with that, I'd like to thank the project team who worked on this CCVA. Uh, on the left, you can see the major um, consulting and engineer groups that helped us out. Um, and then on the right, you can see a list of external experts who were kind enough to, to just support us and offer advice and guidance along the way. So thank you all. And I hope that you all take a look at the final report this summer. Thank you so very much, presenters. This was really a treat. Um, as um, yeah, I want to remind the audience that you should be using the question and answer box to um, raise questions for our panelists. Um, as the audience warms up, I'm going to go ahead and pose some questions and hopefully lead to a discussion. Um, Professor Shifani, uh, you, your uh, presentation is really provocative and you present two forms that resist return to form and highlight the importance of communal capacities. Um, one could also argue that resilient is not only the ability to withstand, but the capacity to respond, where capacity is to be found be, by, beyond passivity. Do you think that only a change in discourse could bring about the change proposed? What it would it take to bring about systematic and robust change, such as the ones that you're proposing, to resist and stand up against the effects of climate change? And um, as you heard, other panelists have uh, included concepts such as risk, vulnerabilities, and threats. How would a change in discourse adjust to these important concepts as well? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question, Viviana, and thanks to all the panelists. I was really compelled today by um, a lot of a lot of what I saw. So exciting stuff all around. Um, obviously, the paper is intended to be a polemic. Um, as you as as was clear, right? Um, we're all working under the rubric of resilience in this conference, um, but. Yes, one, I think we, we absolutely need to change in discourse for the reasons I highlighted in my paper. It goes beyond semantics, in my view, um, because historically speaking, resilience has been so deeply associated with um, imperialist capitalist projects. So, but, but responses to this discourse um, and to risk and threats we face by, through climate change, can and do work right operationally against some of the problems posed by imperialist and capitalist constructions of resilience. Um, I think terroir, the concept that um, Gustavo um, and Sonia discuss is, is actually already on its way sort of in that direction. But I also think we need to be thinking uh, a, a much more historically situatedly about resilience. So for me, the, the solutions need to involve indigenous voices, right? Mm -hmm. um, who've, who've long been uh, in relation not only to social and economic forms of oppression, but climate change, right? Um, we need people like um, locally Emerge Miami or the Dream Defenders, like abolitionist projects are also interested in climate justice. And to me, those sort of more radical forms, right, which talk about capacity are more compelling uh, and more responsive to the actual needs on the ground. Ultimately, for me, market-based development um, and marketplace solutions, technophilic solutions, right, ultimately reinforce the same problems that put us in this position to begin with. Mm. So thank you. Yeah, I, I really thought that Professors Chao and Gustavo's uh, 
proposition really uh, address a potential change in, in paradigm. Uh, we have a, um, a question from the audience for Caitlin. I look forward to the final report. How do you think the burden of adaptation for residents could be reduced within the scope of local government? Caitlin, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, I just typed up a response and I almost hit send, so I can now. Um, so I was, I think it's there. So I was answering with, if I understand the question correctly, um, asking about the burden on local residents, I think that it will be, I think the, the final report will talk to that a bit with what we propose in adaptation solutions for individuals and then the, the jurisdictions um, more regionally or as a whole. But I think it will take policy change and incentives and maybe streamlining um, of permitting processes for certain things. And, um, and hopefully that the CRP can move forward after we get the outreach. You know, we, we wanna talk about this project with the community and explain where it came from and explain the results, but hopefully then we can have workshops where we help implement those adaptation solutions. It's not, it's not meant to be a, a report on a shelf, but it's sort of like our starting off point to, to um, drive some of the change. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Gustavo, um, maybe you can share some of your uh, lessons learned from the Toroyer approach in the Netherlands. What, what are um, some of the lessons that were learned there? You're on mute. Gustavo, you're on mute. There we go, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we think that everything uh, starts with the relationship with nature and, and how you react and um, exchange with the place that you live. So uh, that's what, what Terrar is about. And what it strikes us a lot is uh, many of, of, of the Terrar's examples, paradigmatic examples, are uh, in the coastal areas. And when we think on an extreme uh, or an extreme natural environment like you have in the water and sea in, in the Netherlands and, and Germany, um, and, and a history in which you have, uh, you, you can take a line on how they reacted from uh, storms, great storms, disasters, and how they, they are still um, uh, trying or, or living on those places. Uh, there might be something else that, that attract them uh, to, to still be there, no? Uh, it, it, there is some kind of relationship with the nature that, that he, uh, kept them there and, and the culture that is uh, resulting from this uh, deep exchange with nature is it's what the Frisian and, and the whole area um, is about. And the, the, for us, it was important to, to show how can a place that has a certain pattern similar to, to what we have here in the South Florida, in terms of, of, of vulnerability, uh, could, could also uh, give us a, a, a patterns of, of work or, or understanding of the place. So um, the big lesson is, as, 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 as I said in, 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 the, uh, in the presentation, is the, the the Netherlands says don't fight the water, just live with them. Yeah. Just live with it. So it's a dual entity, and and we have to uh, learn to to live with the water and how the water will uh, start to penetrate in, in 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 the urban areas, and we have to be prepared for those uh, times, and 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 we have to think places that will be floodscapes. Uh, that will be flooded for a certain time of time, but not all the time. And, and so those are buffers between the, 
the wet and the and the and the dry areas. So um, I don't know if uh, if that answers your question, Viviana. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, Professor Chow wants to make a comment. Go ahead. Just really quickly, I think that there are some really important lessons from the Netherlands, you know, do you fight it or do you live with it, right, as Gustavo just mentioned, but there are also the issues that Alison brought up of the inequities and how we deal with those, and so we've seen more and less successful uh, ways to do that globally, right, because, you know, resilience, um, and I'm not sure I agree with the you know, the ties specifically to imperialism, but because I see that there's so many island communities across the globe that are very poor and that are, you know, struggling to, to become uh, resilient precisely because they don't want to lose their, their native habitat. Um, and so um, I, would, I would say that moving forward, the reason that we think that this concept of terroir is significant is because of the very layered approach, which does include um, necessarily the cultural identity of people. And that requires that we, therefore, um, deal with those issues in more equitable terms. Mm -hmm. And whereas perhaps the Resilient 305 report doesn't necessarily um, make that self-evident, having participated in over three years of meetings in those sessions, I saw the real honest effort by our local leaders to, in fact, engage with disenfranchised communities and to speak to some of their issues. And you can see some of that in the report very clearly when they're talking about issues related, for example, to housing, to financial stability, um, how we uh, create a buttress for our community. So there are elements of that, but we can make things, uh, it is a living document. And so it needs to evolve and grow. But yeah. I would say that's the reason why Terrar is significant as a concept. Thank you. I, I want to ask a question to Camila and her team. Uh, you know, the, going back to the, you know, the, 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 the islands and, and, and some other areas that are more under threat. So you examined four indexes of phenomenal examination. Are there areas that you think that none of these indexes are, you know, addressing or assessing? And has any of these countries that you have reviewed used the indexes for policy change? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think Madison would like to speak to the limitations of the indexes. Hi, definitely. Um, so I do think each index, as we've seen in, in its entirety, does have a variety of strengths and weaknesses, just as anyone um, would. Um, however, I do think they do provide a very well-rounded picture on the global resilience to climate change, given that each one assesses such a wide range of environmental issues on so many different scales on how different countries with different vulnerabilities, resources, conditions can really combat climate change, climate change or um, sort of promote adaptation. However, each one does quite have a pretty significant amount of limitations when assessing it, given its wide range of environmental issues that it is incorporating into the indexes. For example, some countries um, are unable to give accurate reports given that the resources that they are given um, opposed to more developing nation or developed nations, whereas other ones choose not to. There are some um, information gaps in the reports, for example, a lot of them choose not to chose not to report and some of them in 2012 for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really, really important to know that a huge benefit of these indexes is that it shows different levels of adaptation on many different scales, given the different regions and variety of countries and their development that it incorporates. Um, in particular with the, the Caribbean, um, it's very vulnerable to climate change and combating it has been increasingly more difficult given, you know, um, how climate change is affecting these countries that are already developing. Um, so I do think there's very a lot of merit and a lot of strength of these indexes. However, it is those information and those data gaps along with providing accurate measurement um, sort of resources to all the countries, not just the most developed um, yeah. that really provide those gaps and those limitations as well. Yeah, so I think we are up, uh, our, our time is up that I, th I want to thank all you know, panelists and, and attendees. Uh, coming up next is a lunchtime keynote chat. I really encourage um, everybody to participate is 
uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, who's a co-founder and chief strategist for Partners in Health, uh, joining in conversation with Dr. Felice Chanel, who's the director of the Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas at UM. The link has been placed in the chat. Uh, don't miss it. It's going to be an interesting conversation. Thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you, audience, and hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.